Hello and welcome to the Omnex webinar IATF 16949 Requirements for Embedded Software Automotive Spice. Today's presentation is being performed by Nikhil Unakrishnan. He is an Omnex consultant. Nikhil has worked with organizations to analyze process deficiency and drive improvement by Im implementing best in class practices conforming to internationally recognized standards such as Automotive Spice, ISO 26262 for functional safety, ISO 9001, IATF 16949, and others. Nikhil is a certified green belt in Lean Six Sigma methodologies. He is also exemplar certified lead auditor for IATF 16949, ISO 9001. Nikhil is also a Automotive Spice Provisional Assessor. During this webinar, if you have any questions, please enter them in your questions dialog box, and Nikhil will get to them at the end of the webinar. Take it away, Nikhil. Thank you for the introduction, Miles. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody who's joining us from various parts of the globe. Thank you for taking the time and joining in for this uh, webinar. Uh, so today, we are going to focus our attention on IATF 16949 requirements for embedded software and how Automotive Spice helps us achieve these particular requirements. All right? Okay. So as we are speaking, so today we'll you know talk about how Automotive Spice helps us achieve the requirements of embedded software within IATF 16949. All right? So for any of you that are that is new to Omnex, Omnex is a 34-year-old uh, international consulting, training, and software development organization headquartered here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We specialize in integrated management system solutions, and uh, we work with numerous industry standards in the automotive, aerospace, semiconductor, health, uh, medical devices, and food and safety sectors. And uh, we also are actively involved in driving process improvements across all organizations uh, through various methodologies such as Lean Six Sigma and other breakthrough systems. And, uh, you know, a little bit about Omnex. Uh, most of you, uh, you know, who are familiar with Omnex know about this already, but uh, our association with uh, the, uh, you know, the automotive sector goes a long way back. Um, especially being uh, a very integral part in the global rollout of supply training for Ford Motor Companies back in 90s. And then uh, across the globe, we have more than about 700 professionals, uh, you know, people speaking in different, you know, uh, different languages across the regions. Uh, we have active presence in North America, Europe, China, India, Southeast Asia, and other places. A little bit about our group. We have the consulting division, the systems, and the plant tech and training uh, divisions as well, each playing a specific role on particular domains, particular functions. This is something about our software solution. We have APQP solutions, management system solutions, and supplier quality solutions uh, that you know, are available as part of our in enterprise-wide integrated quality and management system suite. And this is, again, used by our customers in automotive, aerospace, and other sectors. A little bit about our global footprint. OK, so talking about me and my association with uh, Automotive Spice, uh, I've been helping organizations implement this standard by integrating them into their standard business pro processes, which might already be conforming with standards such as IATF 16949 if they are in the automotive sector. And for other you know, sectors, if they're just designed, they might be already ISO 9001 certified. And some other organizations, they, we also drive uh, implementation of functional safety, uh, and uh, other standards such as cybersecurity, et cetera. So also, uh, so that's kind of where, you know, Automotive Spice and my association has been. And uh, throughout 
this presentation, we'll see how it is very much relevant when it comes to the automotive sector and how it is growing its influence on the, this particular sector. All right, so the agenda, before we skip to the agenda, I just want to bring our focus on a particular line over here. So just in 2019, so I was analyzing some of the failures that came uh, from the past year uh, in terms of automotive recalls. And I was surprised to learn that we had more than 2.5 million cars that were recalled just in 2019, just due to some sort of software failure. And uh, this, you know, some of them are trivial, some of them are very much critical that may even affect the safe performance of a vehicle. So some of, and as you all know, with the automotive sector going more electric, EV and AV, electric vehicle and autonomous driving, this is going to be even more significant in times to come. And uh, through systems such as ADAS, advanced driver assistance systems, autonomous driving, parking, etc., this is just going to keep on grow, growing exponentially. And uh, you know, having a good software that goes into embedded systems, uh, that, that's going to be really critical to, to an organization's success. OK. So in today's webinar, we'll look at some of the software issues in current automobiles and embedded software requirements in IATF 69. Why do we say we should go for automotive spice? And we'll explore a little bit about what automotive spice requirements are and what the capability levels are and what is happening around the industry, particularly to the standard. All right. So let's see. So this is one of the incidents from last year again this one for chevy malibu you know the software problem could stop engine from starting or stall as you know for some uh, customers if you supply to like for example gm uh, vehicle starting is a critical safety element and uh, and uh, you know these uh, vehicles have been recalled to get them fixed again as you see software problem is what caused this issue this is another one from last year's news. Another software failure affecting key fun uh, key systems failure in the vehicle. So here, uh, you know, the electronic brake control module and anti-lock brake system, uh, these were affected by a software issue. All right. Another one, Ford. When it came to Ford, and another faulty software issue where F-150s were recalled. Again, this was the model year 2013. And uh, apparently they had a recall that was performed and which did not happen properly. And then they had to do another recall. So it's like double rework sort of, uh, you know, so as to speak. And then we have Volkswagen and Porsche and they had about two, 227, 227,000 uh, cars, uh, you know, being recalled because of airbag seat belt issues. And again, there's again impact on software. Talking about Mazda, they had issues too. So what, I, what we're seeing is not just one OEM or one uh, particular supplier that's facing this issue, it's across the industry. And uh, as you all know, new technologies coming in, they're prone to higher uh, chances of failures. With the industry going more EV and AV, the content of software coming in more and more, it is no surprise that software is one of you know the top failures. And here we can see another issue from Nissan. And that's again a backup camera defect. This is actually a requirements issue. Once we dig more deep into this uh, issue, uh, the requirement of certain things to be disabled were not incorporated into the system's design itself. Uh, and which you know had to be reworked and then included. So again, it doesn't matter where in the life cycle this particular uh, failure happens. At the end of the day, it is cost to the company. Another fault issue, what we can see, and then also another example from Toyota. So uh, even the Prius, you know, twenty thousand hybrid Prius is being recalled. So. As I said, you know, it's not just one OEM or another one, it's across the industry. We've been seeing software failures being a top 
uh, issue in vehicle recalls. Now, all of these issues are driving inputs into the IATF 16949 standard. So as you can see, uh, when uh, you know uh, the International Automotive Task Force revised this particular standard in 2016, uh, what happened? They had incorporated uh, from you know recalls and emission scandals that we are all familiar with. One of the clauses that were that was included is to have in you know in clause five we need to to have certain corporate responsibility requirements uh, about ethics and then uh, you know there was a need to simplify CSRs which came from tier ones and then part of the industry going towards AV and EV we got now embedded software and functional safety we got more requirements flowing into that and that's what drove these particular clauses into IIT of 16949 we'll take a closer look at these clauses in the slides to come and uh, how they affect your design and your supplier uh, processes supplier management processes okay so particularly if you look at the 16949 standard we got the automotive specific requirements right the standard itself and then there's this uh, the rules document that is applicable for the registrars and for the certification bodies and then of course we have this uh, customer specific requirements the key thing to note here is that just like your requirements for from iso 9001 or 16949 the requirements from your customers uh, whether it is a tier one uh, you know, you still have to include them into your business management processes. So, uh, you know, subscribing customers, as you know, it is easy to get it from the IITF website, and it, all the clauses are aligned with the high level structure. It is very easy to integrate. If you do have supplier without that, then you got to take their supply quality manual and uh, do, do the same thing. And it goes same when, when we talk about customer specific requirements, you also have customer requirements that flow in part of your contractual requirements and uh, any other requirements that come with your product and uh, whichever product you're launching, right? Okay. And uh, for the 16949 certification, as you all know, it can only be done if you have a manufacturing site, meaning to say, if I'm just a design house, I cannot get 16949 certified, right? So if you look at closer look at uh, bullet number two on the slide, uh, it applic applicable to sites where manufacturing of customer specified production parts, service parts, and or accessory parts. So for design for design houses or sites with just design, they you know they they have to conform with the requirements of ISO 9001, right? And would uh, would 9000 would one would be just enough uh, we'll take you know uh, at the end of this uh, webinar you'll get a better picture of why that may just not be enough you may have to look at other standards that are key into ensuring business success okay so moving on the first clause within the 16949 standard where they talk about embedded systems is if you look at the bullet number two, a software development assessment methodology must be used to assess the process, okay? And a process for quality assurance for products with internally developed embedded software, software must be used. So it goes to say you need to have a process for quality assurance of the products with embedded systems, and then you need to have some sort of an assessment going into it to ensure that it is you know happening as per the PDCA, cycle and uh, everything is good and you know being happening as it is supposed to be so it does make a reference saying examples include automotive spice and iso 26262 part 6 it doesn't say it's a shell but it says it's an example okay but it does say the 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 the, the shell does go on to say you know that you need to have a process assurance right and in the last bullet you can see software development must be included within the internal audit program scope so you have your standard audits that happen throughout the year such as your qms audits your ems audits your uh, you know osha's audit and uh, other standards you comply to that's happening 
Along with that, just like you have the plan and the actual going on for those standards, you need to have your software assessment, uh, you know, uh, the, the assessments being planned and executed in the same fashion. All right. And it should be part of your internal audit program. Basically means to say you need to have a plan, you need to have competent uh, resources to perform this, and you need to make sure this is performed on time. And if there are issues and findings, you need to address them, close them, and, and you know put in place proper corrective actions, right? The whole cycle. And uh, as I said, you know the key note here is ASPICE and 26262 are being referenced here. And when we get to the clause 84231, where you know as you know 84 deals with the supplier management control, basically control of externally provided processes and products, right? So within this section. You can see how IATF says organization shall require the suppliers of automotive product related software or automotive products with embedded software to implement and maintain a process for software quality assurance. So it does say not just for your own organization, but also for your suppliers, right? And it has to be utilized, and you need to have a software development assessment methodology to assess the supplier software development process too. So basically, IATF says, not just for your own organization, but if you're getting your software from your suppliers, you need to have proper checks and balances in your system to make sure that you look at your supplier supply chain as well. And with you know the standard rule of thumb, uh, rule of thumb applies, you're again, prioritizing, prioritizing your suppliers based on risk and potential impact to the customer and you know the standard uh, requirements also apply as you evaluate your suppliers so when you talk about, when ITF says software assessment process uh, what does that mean right so that's something we need to get a better idea of so let's see what what this is all about so if you take a look at the terms and definitions Embedded software, uh, you know, is software that actually goes into the product and I have it bolded here must be developed for an automotive application. So it's some some sort of software that goes into your system uh, in, in your actual vehicle system. So could be something like uh, onboard navigation system could be some sort of uh, sensors, you know, uh, uh, and it could be any sort of advanced functionality that that is uh, helping with your sa vehicle safety or in entertainment or infotainment, anything of that sort. So th those are the various items, uh, you know, embedded software. It's not a calibration software that might be in the production floor, or it's not like the preventive maintenance uh, softwares that are used in uh, in the organization manufacturing site. So just to be clear, this is software that goes actually into the product moving on and in the vocabulary in 16949 you can see when they talk about software process assessment they have citations for capability maturity model integration called as cmmi or automotive spice and uh, what spice stands for is software process improvement and capability determination when they came to the last word they took the e more importantly than the D. So that's how they came with the automotive spice acronym. So, so uh, there, there is again, you have the option either to go for CMMI or to go for automotive spice. But we say automotive spice. Why? We like we we'll, uh, give you some more insight into this, uh, you know, aspect in the slides to come. So, why automotive spice? A couple of OEMs. Uh, as you you know that I've already elected to go the route of automotive spice. All the European OEMs, part of the you know being in VDA, they all require automotive spice. Uh, they don't, or extremely rarely, might even talk about C using CMMI. And uh, in the North American automotive uh, sphere, you can see Ford, FCA, Packer, and many others also. Uh, you know, asking their suppliers to conform with the requirements of uh, automotive spice, and uh, basically they're driving automotive spice 
into their supply chain rather than uh, CMMI. So indirectly, the customers asking their suppliers to do it. So that is driving this particular uh, standard. So let's now take a closer look of what uh, Automotive Spice is all about. Okay, understanding Automotive Spice. So what is Automotive Spice? So Automotive Spice is like, you know, a framework for designing and assessing software development processes. So what that means is for your software development process, the guidelines that you can use, uh, you know, follow to ensure that you have robust, uh, a robust software development process. That is what automotive, automotive spice is going to help you achieve. Okay, and as it says, if you implement it effectively, it leads to better process and better product quality. So lesser recalls, lesser faults and defects, and uh, in other words, you know, savings to the company and better efficiency overall. And uh, it also is a key, uh, so the guidelines itself is structured in such a way that, uh, you know, with the current uh, global supply chain, you got uh, some some of the activities going on in one continent and the others happening in another continent, and you want all of them to talk to each other and work together. So the guidelines in Automotive Spice also improve the cooperation among all of these complex uh, supply chain, you know, supply chains and uh, empower the suppliers to do to do a better job at uh, working together especially in the engineering centers all right now automotive spice as we said is a uh, you know it uh, in the previous slide i said what spice stands for it is software process improvement capability and capability determination where in the last particular word they took the e and that's how spice came into existence and what is driving Spice? As we said, a lot of the customers are mandating that their suppliers do it, right? Because if you implement the guidelines that overall defines your software development process, uh, you know, ideally to improve the way the software is uh, coming out, it actually helps the customer itself, right? So they are mandating that their suppliers do it and uh, they give out target capability levels we'll see what capability levels are they give out target capability levels saying hey your project should be at capability level two or your organization overall should be a capability level three and uh, if you don't meet those capability levels then they come back and say uh, you know th this is not acceptable you may work with the issues and then again you know the negotiation goes between you and your customer on how to get those resolved. And uh, ultimately what it leads to is, uh, if the rating goes down, you have a risk of lo losing future contracts or being forced into lesser profitable orders. So that is how you know customers are driving this down their supply chain and um, making it you know, a mandatory requirement. Efficiency improvements. So not just, you know, you know, with uh, tier ones, tier twos, not just because the OEMs are asking them to do it, but some of them have voluntarily taken this upon themselves to follow with the ASPICE guidelines because they want to improve, because they want lesser mistake, lesser rework and reduce costs, right? So they want that to happen and they've taken it upon themselves to follow Automotive Spice. And, uh, Another positive thing about a, a Spice is uh, in the next slide I'll show you how uh, the the whole you know a Spice is laid out. The the way it is structured is very easily it is possible to integrate with your ISO 26262 Part 6. So in your functional safety standard Part 6 is where you have the guidelines for uh, software development, and there it, it uh, a Spice integrates with it very easily and seamlessly. So that is another reason why we have automotive spice uh, you know being preferred among cmmi uh, and then you have new requirements for iatf as we saw the clauses in a few slides earlier those requirements indirectly mandate 
uh, that you know you follow your customer specific requirements in one place and then it says you need to have a uh, software development process also defined that that ensures you know you have there's a check and balance in place so all of this leads to a spice being uh, you know a must have if you are in these uh, the sphere where you're developing software for your uh, OEMs or your tier ones or uh, tier twos. So this is how automotive spice processes are laid out. This is the the overall um, automotive spice, and as you can see, the whole standard it's broken broken down into acquisition process in the left. I'm starting from the left side. We have acquisition processes, and then we have. Uh, uh, the supplier process group and then we have supporting process group and then we have uh, management process group reuse process group process improvement process group so these are the side uh, groups of processes we have the core of the whole standard is what we see in the center the systems engineering process group and the software engineering process group okay so the systems engineering process groups start from sys1 and go through six sys5 uh, and the software engineering group goes from SWE 1 to SWE 6. So what ha is happening here is, as you can see, it's a V model, very similar to what we have in functional safety, correct? And uh, it starts from systems requirements analysis. It goes to systems architectural design. And in software, it goes to the software requirements analysis. It goes to software architectural design and goes to software detail design and unit construction. That's where you have your uh, code. The, the actual code is being made in SWE 3. And then it goes to unit verification in SWE 4. And then you have integration tests, qualification tests at the software level. And then it goes up the V model to the system integration test and the qualification test. So that is the core. Uh, product development, v, uh, you know, V model flow there, and you have all of these supporting processes helping the organization achieve it. Okay, all right. So now let's take a look closer look at. So here about we got about 32, 33 processes in this page, and uh, uh, you know, implementing all of these and managing these may or you know may not be feasible and basically there you prioritize certain processes and then you implement them we'll see what are the recommended approaches in the industry when you come to doing that rather than implementing all of these processes that you see on the slide we have something called the vda scope so the processes highlighted in red are what belongs to the vda scope so as you can see other than sys1 which is requirements elicitation all the systems engineering process groups and the software engineering process groups fall into the uh, vda scope and what does uh, vda scope mean so vda scope is a commonly uh, used scope that the oems ask their suppliers to conform to okay and you can see uh, sys1 is usually done by the oems when they define you know what is the actual end customer requiring and then translating them into requirements so all of that is done usually by the oems and that's why it's been left out of the video scope among the other processes that you can see on this slide you can see supplier monitoring again that is sometimes not uh, used by process you know uh, suppliers in tier ones and tier twos uh because uh, it may be done by the oems in some cases uh and then we got the supporting process group your quality assurance configuration management problem resolution and change request management and of course on the top right you can see there's also project management okay so these process the these 16 processes together form the vda scope and are potent, usually this is the scope that we've seen suppliers being asked to follow too. And that could be tailored uh, process groups too, you know, depending on how and what you do and where you are in the supply chain, et cetera. Another common one that we've seen is called the extended scope. So here I've 
highlighted in blue the remaining process we have product release verification joint review and risk management so these four processes also added to the vda scope is called the vda scope extended okay some people also call it the ford scope uh, because i've seen some sub, you know ford suppliers being asked to do that and uh, you know, again, as I said, it is a case, on a case-to-case -case basis. It could be different scope. Okay, so let's. So this is uh, basically the the big picture of automotive spice, and uh, let's take a look, closer look at what uh, capability levels are. So earlier I mentioned OEMs ask their suppliers to uh, you know confirm or reach a certain capability level. In some scenarios, they just say for this given project. Uh, you know, you have to meet uh, capability level two, or uh, for some other projects, they say you have to, uh, you know, the whole organization, you, you have to do it at capability level three. So what this means, I'll walk you through. And uh, in some other scenarios, we've we've seen they say the engineering processes alone should be at capability level three and uh, or, or or capability level two, and then the Management process can be at a different capability level. So they might specify, tailor it, and say that. Okay. So starting from level zero through level five, basically level zero says you're, you know, the, 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 nothing exists. You're not cap uh, a spice at all. So there's no process results existing. It's incomplete or inappropriate. And, uh, you know, nothing is happening. In capability level one, you have some sort of process outcomes getting achieved, but results are just created somehow. So it is not clear how you're achieving what, what you're achieving, but it just happens so. And I'll use an interesting example to walk you through what these capability levels mean in the coming slides. Uh, and uh, capability level two, you have some sort of performances controlled somehow. There's some, some planning involved. There's some sort of monitoring. and uh, responsibilities are defined and uh, here when it says results under QA and CM it says there is quality assurance and configuration management activities also coming into picture let me actually stress another point going back to the slide two processes that are of critical in nature configuration management and quality assurance these are two processes within the support process categories along with uh, project management of course which are key into ensuring that your a spice process uh, you know ha work successfully so that's why in capability level 2 they they specifically call out QA and CM okay and uh, level 3 uh, we'll see that until level 2 we are talking project specific planning and guidelines and process definitions from level 3 onwards we are taking it uh, to another level taking it across the whole organization so level three and above we are talking about organization wide all right so in capability level three we have established processes and in capability level four we have predictable and in five it goes to innovating capability level three is what we've uh, you know seen in, across the industry at, at, the, at a maximum four and five are not uh, given out as requirements by the OEMs typically, and uh, uh, you know, typically we haven't seen any organizations at levels four or five if they are following the in-tax uh, guidelines. Okay, so anyway, so capability level three is pretty much where it kind of maxes out. Now, what these levels mean is. Level zero, we you know it is incomplete. There is no achievement. Nothing is happening. In level one, there is PA 1.1. PA refers to process attributes, and there's some sort of outcomes coming out, but there's no predictability or management happening at that level. And then when it comes to level two, you're look at looking at performance management and work product management. Going to level three, you're looking at process definition and deployment of those processes. And four, you go to qualitative, quantitative analyses and quantitative control. And at level five, you're going through innovation. So something interesting to note here is PA 3.1, 
which is process definition. Omnix has recommended that when you know organizations implement a spice aim for level three. Do not even if your you know OEM or your customer asks you to go for level two, it makes better sense to go for level three because you could still define your process for per three uh, PA three point one even though your deployment may not have successfully taken place, which you can eventually do in time to come, but at least have the definition in place uh, that can help you, you know, with everything else. So an organization, if they are at level three, it means they have to conform with the requirements of level one and level two and level three. Same, if they are at level two, it means they have to conform with requirements of uh, level one and also level two, okay? So it is an incremental process, in other words. So I'm going to use an interesting cookie example to walk you through what these levels mean. So over here, we say the, the goal is to make cookies, okay? And purpose, so prepare tasty cookies for the whole family, right? Outcomes, you need best ingredients, the best ingredients are selected. And of course, you want people to remain healthy and not be sick after eating the cookies, right? So those are the outcomes and we've defined it. And let's walk through the different capability levels and how they would relate to making cookies. So in level zero, you, you're basically, you, you're just taking something and just putting it in the oven and just heating it and uh, something comes out. It, it might not be even dough. It might be something in your fridge, you know, take ketchup and throw it. It's that kind of, you're not achieving anything. There's no cookies coming out. In level one, you are taking some basic ingredients and making cookies. Maybe, maybe you did take some dough or not. Maybe you took something else and then you're putting it all into the oven and you're cooking it based on some sort of experience and then you are baking it and when you serve it to the uh, the people enjoying the cookies everybody might be getting a different sort of cookie some some are baked some are not baked there was no deliberate approach you know the quality might not uh, be satisfactory and it is there is no assurance that if you make this if you do the same steps again First of all, you don't know what you did the first time, right? But if you, even if you did, it's not sure that whether you will succeed. So in capability level one, you are getting it done somehow, but there's no you know, sort of standardization overall. Next one, managed. So in managed, you, there is some sort of planning that goes into this capability level. So you're deciding on the recipe. You have cooking methods, deadlines, and budget, and then you're basically just like making a project plan you're asking somebody to go get the get the supplies somebody else to get you know get preheat the oven make the and and again in this level there is more planning involved and uh, you are getting the cookie made somehow but uh, again it is just specific to making that cookies and it may not be the, the whole process may not be in other words stable or well defined uh, but there is some sort of management coming into place. You have some sort of project plans and other work products. Uh, so another word that we talked about is work products. So work products not just talk about the actual software code or something that might be coming out, but also the associated records and input documents that might be going, you know, the output of your whole software development process. So everything. All of these things together are called work products, okay? So it could be records, it could be your plan documents, it could be your process documents, everything is a work product. And in level three, you're developing some tailoring, some guidelines on making cookies. So if you want to make like a macadamia nut cookie or a chocolate chip cookie or something else, uh, you have certain processes defined and then you are tailoring that process to making a specific kind of cookie or there is a certain pro, you know processes and guidelines defined for each type and then even with this the challenge is the process may not be predictive okay 
and uh, you might not objectively know where to improve you might not have go you know uh, you know you, you would have some sort of goals and kpis defined at this level but you don't know why they are not met time to time so there is still room for improvement but your you do have some sort of uh, definitions and uh, items in place so remember when we talked about level three we talked about process definitions and process deployment so those are the two key pas that apply to uh, capability level three okay all right so over here let's go and see how this would be different when we go to level four in this one you are doing some sort of data collection uh, over metrics and then you're doing some sort of statistical analysis and uh, you're proactively avoiding false decisions during your planning but th there is still no absolute certain way to prevent bad data from occurring so you you have a fairly established process at uh, actually at level three and above but in level four you have some sort of predictability coming into picture and uh, but although it is predictable you still cannot prevent bad data from occurring okay in level five what you're doing is you look at the failures that might have happened into making this cookie or something and then you are improving upon it you're innovating you have some sort of r d in place you some sort of um, you are basically uh, taking it one step ahead of predicting and you are making sure that bad data does not happen everything happens perfectly as the way it should be so this is the ideal way and it, it is no surprising that that is why we've never you know we've never seen any organization actually at capability level five per the intact standard uh, guidelines now there are some other guidelines too uh, and uh, some may have you know within a spice um there is the int in tax and the, then there is the int rsa so in one we may have seen uh, some you know organizations reaching capability level five all right let's next go to the all right i have the slide switched so we saw how capability levels are and in this slide we'll explore take a sample requirement from uh aspice and see how what this means and you know what is it all about so sys2 is the systems requirements analysis process bp stands for base practice so you know to simplify i'm going to say if you are at level one you have to meet all base practices of a automotive spice okay so if you have to say that your uh, project is at uh, level one you have to say all whatever scope that you have processes mapped out to for all those processes all break based practices you you have to uh, get to uh, level uh, you have to meet all the base practices and uh, in this base practice bp1 what it says is use stakeholder requirements and changes to stakeholder requirements to identify the required functions and capabilities of the system specify functional and non-functional requirements in a systems requirement specification so a couple of key things to look at here they say define identify the required functions and capabilities of the system specify functional and non-functional so not just functional but also non-functional requirements right and then basically have all of them specified so and also there is a in, in brackets you have outcomes one five seven so for each process that you take you have certain outcomes that you want to achieve just like we saw with the cookie making example you want to make good cookies made people staying healthy right all these are the outcomes and how you achieve these outcomes are you, through your base practices Okay, so you have outcomes, how you achieve them are through your brace practices. And then we see a few notes right below that. So notes were actually, um, you know, just like we've seen with other standards, um, just like IATF, notes are some, somewhat 
you know interpretations offered by the OEMs into the standard itself. So over here we have note one saying application parameter influencing functions capabilities are part of the system requirements. So application parameters should also be specified in the systems requirements specification or the document, right? For changes to stakeholders requirements, SUP 10 applies. So SUP 10 is change request management process. So it says anytime you do there's a change to stakeholder requirements, the SUP 10 change request management process should be called out and it should follow that process. So notes are also important, just like the requirements over here. So for this particular base practice, let us check out what it means. An example would be there is evidence that customer requirements have been analyzed in terms of functionality and feasibility. So there's cost, schedule, all of those items defined. There's analysis, reviews, results, reviews, records available. So these are all of your work products as well. And there's traceability of system requirements to customer requirements as well. One of the key features that ASPICE is stresses about throughout is bidirectional traceability. So when you talk about bidirectional traceability, it's not just one way, not from the system to the subsystem to the component, but, but all the way back as well. So you, you should be able to trace from the component to the sub, uh, subsystem to the system, as well as if you look, remember the V model we just saw a few slides ago, we saw the V model, right? So if you are doing uh, integration testing, you have to do it to the architecture, right? And if you're doing the qualification test, you're doing it to the requirements overall. So there is bidirectional traceability that ASPICE stresses about throughout, if you look at the standard. And uh, here, if you have a systems requirements document that sh shows evidence and that proper review was done to the requirements, all of these would serve as evidence into meeting that particular requirement, okay? And uh, again, requirements are of up to date and reflect any changes. So if there has been configuration changes or product revisions, it goes from Rev A to Rev B or config 10 to 12.1, uh, whatever it is. So all of those have to be traced back properly and you should be able to relate what requirements were applicable to that particular uh, version or and to that particular version of change all right now we'll just take a closer look at capability levels two and three and in level two it means like i said earlier right if an organization says that they are uh, for this project they are at level two it means they have to also satisfy requirements of level one so in addition to meeting all the base practices at level one, they also have to show that process performance is now consistently planned and tracked. And then work products are adequately monitored and maintained. So these two, and uh, if you take a closer look at that, the second item, work products are adequately monitored and maintained. Which one do you think it applies to? It applies to configuration management right so there's a good practice in place where you're taking your work products and you're con managing them and uh, in level two among other things you have your scope very clearly defined for the performance of the process and then process activities are also defined and a good practice would be to ensure that they're all documented in detail and there is no ambiguity for level three, you all you have to meet whatever was required for level two and level one, and whatever uh, the previously described managed processes is now implemented using a defined process that is capable of achieving its process outcomes. So in level two, it was project specific. It was just for that project, I had a project plan, I had a configuration plan just for that project, etc. And I'm getting to level three, I'm taking it one step ahead and I'm standardizing that across for my organization and I'm laying out, if I'm doing quality assurance, these are the steps I'm gonna take. And then if I want, I could develop tailoring guidelines specific to particular projects. 
All right. So that is what capability level two and three mean. And if you take a look, closer look at this graphic that I have here, it elaborates how for levels one and two, you have project level documentation. So you have quality plans, project specific or tailored processes, project specific or tailored work instructions. All of these are part of your levels one and two. And then when you're trying to go a level three and above, you have standardized uh, you know, quality policies, manual, standardized processes, work instructions, all of those apply. And then all of your industry standards that are applicable to you that are also uh, part of your process definition. So this is how you would go from level one to two to three and uh, keep on improving that. Coming back, from what we've seen, this is a slide we saw early. We saw how for level two and three, we need performance management and work product management. And for level three, we need process definition and process deployment, right? So again, it goes from not having anything to becoming performed to going to be managed and then goes to be established and then it goes to be predictable and then you keep on innovating. Right? All right. So having explored ASPICE a little bit, why? Is this in you know becoming more uh, important in the automotive sphere now because of the share of electronics and software items as we've seen right and then IATF is mandating that you need to have uh, software development processes uh, quality assurance for software development processes not just for yourself but also for your suppliers and that way, the other standards are also Im impacting software development in the automotive sphere. So you have, if there is uh, items that affect functional safety of your product, ISO 26262 part six applies, right? And uh, eventually we've seen how cybersecurity risks are also coming into the uh, existing electronic, uh, systems in, auto, uh, in in automobiles and uh, the ISO SAE 21434 the cybersecurity standard uh, and that that one also the part nine of that particular standard would also be driving uh, and impacting software development in in the automotive sphere in days to come and of course we've seen how automotive spice is a direct player in uh, imp impacting uh, software development overall. So, do software companies need a QMS? Which ones? Why? So, if you take a look at functional safety, um, and you see that QMS are at a minimum required, right? And for for even if it is not an ASIL A, B, C, or D, and QM is mandatory. So, for organizations that just do uh, design it might be ISO 9001 and if you are part of the organization also doing manufacturing it would be 16949 so all of this is driving the integration between these various standards and uh, again as we've seen uh, software development is being impacted by the requirements from um, all of these various standards so as we just said, so we got IATF 16949, 9001, because of the complex automotive supply chain, right? And it is calling out for ASPICE, whether if you manufacture or if you're just 9001, that'll be it. And then because of increased use of electronics in cars, you got 26262 functional safety standard. And then same goes for security in connected vehicles. That is why we have 26262. Very similar reason why we have connected communication, connected vehicle communication. So it could be V2V as well as V2 infrastructure or other systems too. So whatever communication that vehicles are having, those are all potential risks for cybersecurity attacks or intrusions, right? So all of these being context 
and in when you're developing software for auto, you know automotive applications a spice becomes a mandatory must have in, uh, whether your uh, customer is asking for it or not it would be a great practice to implement it so that you are driving improvement to your software development processes okay and that is the reason again uh, having these different standards don't mean that you need to have standalone uh, project plans or things like that so for example we have an apqp pro for a for a new product that is being launched for a new program that is being launched you have the apqp plan and then you may have the safety plan to go along with it because the product has safety implications functional safety implications right so uh, this will be again part of uh, your same process and again automotive spice would also have project management for which is in man 3 we saw going into the project management uh, process so all of these have very close interrelationships um and uh, you know that that could drive uh, integration within your organization and use of integrated tools again further help you achieve this particular goal all right coming to my summary so iatf requires that a software development assessment methodology shall be utilized to assess the organizations and its supplier software development process right as we saw it's not just for your own self but if you're getting a supplier manufacturer you know develop i mean a supplier to develop your software you have to get them to do it too and then automotive spice has become the preferred methodology to assess software development processes of suppliers in the automotive sector due to customer requirements we saw how oems are driving this requirement down their supply chain and making suppliers do this uh, and uh, also it helps bring in savings there was a study you know study that um, in terms of cost you are looking at some sort of uh, 1.4 times savings if you're going from uh, to if you're going to level two if you're going to level three you're going for 2.2 times savings it is about 2.9 times savings if you're going for level four and projected savings of 3.4 at level 5. And here, when you're implementing automotive spice, you're bringing robust practices into the embedded software development process, and you're driving down software failures and gaining savings. So we saw that a spice has capability levels 0 through 5. 0 means you're not at all a spice for any project, nothing at all. And then it start, basically goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And then Common expectations for OEMs are a level two capability at the project level or level three for the whole organization. And again, we saw how ITF 16949, APQP core tools, functional safety, ASPICE have many requirements focused in the same areas. This again emphasizes what Onyx has been preaching for a long time integrate wherever you can because that brings in time more time more savings and helps you improve your standardize processes too right having an integrated software tool is key to fulfilling all the requirements of multiple standards such as automotive spice 26262 and cyber security so uh, this is a common issue that we see when uh, you know when we look at organizations and how they're doing currently uh, we might have a systems project plan which is totally different might not be aligned with the how the software plan is going on um, same way uh, how configuration might be working uh, might not cover the entire scope of work products being uh, you know generated out of the software development processes so those are various challenges that you could address if you standardize the approach and uh, have integrated software tools uh, to help achieve them okay so here is a list of upcoming webinars uh, we have one coming up about the disruption in the automotive ev av automotive market ev and av vehicles in january 30th and challenges of implementing apqp on january 31st and uh, another interesting one implementing and testing cyber security uh, in feb 11th and the other ones to be announced so 
make sure you subscribe to these now something to also note is um uh, you know if you have uh, it would be a good idea to if you have internal assessors that need to be trained get them uh, run through trainings and get them qualified so that they can uh, perform internal assessments uh, to aspice requirements here's some uh, trainings that we have uh, coming up in various locations uh, in north america i'm starting with uh, the first question here will when will truck oem csrs be included on the website so um, i am not sure if you're just talking about iem i, I believe you're talking about iatf csrs uh, or um, i believe you're talking about iatf csrs in that particular question paula so um, that would be a good question we could circle back with i do not have an answer to that yet uh, this would be um, we could definitely ask and get back to you on that yeah another question is what advantage does a spice have over cmmi yes i believe you and uh, yes uh, we've covered that during the slides it is being driven down by oems like uh, one of the one of the you know, truck manufacturing companies that we've said packer for example is asking uh, their suppliers to do um, a spice so that is a very direct um, indication that uh, this is the way the industry is going um, and uh, pretty much the reason okay another question which are processes to implement so implementing processes it would be based on whatever your customer is asking you to do um, so you know typically it might be the VDS scope as we saw in the earlier slides or it could be uh, for example um, the extended VDS scope or maybe a tailored down version what if you're not involved in systems development at all it might just be the software scope so in that scenario you might just be doing that uh, with a few supporting processes so it's it is on a case-to-case -case basis so if uh, another question we have here is minimum target levels. So again, minimum target capability levels are also subject to different uh, projects. So meaning to say, uh, you know, it could be level two that they might be asking. We've seen Ford, for example, ask for many projects level two. Um, um, some of the German customers, some of the German OEMs, they ask for uh tailored approach they might ask engineering processes you have to be at certain level and uh, supporting processes at a different level so that is again on a case-to-case -case basis and uh, you'll have to define with your customer and uh, execute that and there is no hard and fast rule that you only have to implement the exact processes that your customer asks you to do for example risk management is sometimes integrated into implementation with your vda scope uh, along with the other processes that is just an organization's you know choice to improve and uh, be get better robustness at certain areas they feel they might be currently weak so uh, another question i see um, explain further vda scope done by oems uh, as a supply to truck oems we also utilize part of vda audits just to clarify the vda 6.3 and other standards are a little bit different this one is um, th th that that could be different and uh, this we were specifically just talking about how automotive spice applies uh, and vda is just a scope uh, within the entire 33 set of processes that are that is an a spice uh, that has been picked and said this is a vda scope okay so please include some examples from tr truck industry we'll make sure we do that from uh, webinars going forward thank you for that input so what are pas so pas are process attributes it's basically uh, features of a process that can be evaluated in some sort of a scale achievement so uh, when we say levels what you know when you take a closer look into how a spice is assessed basically um, to achieve uh, level two you have to meet requirements of pa 2.1 and 2.2 so 
all of these uh, should be uh, you know achieved um, so pa you might be using a ranking or a rating scale called a common one that is used is the NPLF so you say not at all achieved poorly achieved largely achieved and fully achieved and then um, provided that for all of the PAs to a given level is at L largely or fully achieved you would say that uh, you know you have achieved that particular capability level there is no averaging in ACEWISE by the way so you have to achieve for each of those base practices and uh, process attributes. So, so there was a question about how does ASPICE work with Scrum approach? Yes, Scrum is a very, yes, uh, good question. So that is uh, you know, commonly used in the software industry, right? The Scrum, Scrum approach. Uh, so it might be the, there is the agile, the scaled agile. Uh, there are various methodologies in place that people might, uh, organization might be uh, organizations might be adopting so yes as long as you are meeting the requirements laid out in a spice then you are good so it doesn't say that you have to do in just waterfall or methodology or something that is just an example we just showed uh, for simplicity uh, if you are following scrum approach and you have uh, you know whatever approaches that you internally follow you could have those still done provided you still conform to all the requirements of automotive spice all right i believe uh, that's all for now we've come to the end of the webinar again thank you all for joining in uh, and uh, tune in for future webinars to come and also check out our website uh, www.omnex.com you have a wide variety of resources you could uh, log in you could access pre-recorded webinars and uh, go through them and if you need any training consulting or software solutions help let us know we are here to help you thank you and you all have a great day and a great weekend thanks <laughs>